thought it was under participants.
Bilam, where it's explicit in the Torah why he is referred to as Rasha. Haman, it's explicit in the Megillah what his uh, issues were. Anybody else? Any other biblical people referred to as Rasha that you could think of or that you could maybe assume? Okay, so I'll give you a couple. Paro, right? That also makes sense, right? Because he enslaved uh, B'nai Israel, the Jewish people, murdered the, uh, the baby boys. You need one of each. Okay, so we got Paro, Bilam, Nebuchadnezzar, who destroyed the first temple. He is referred to as Rasha in the Talmud. We said Haman. Titus, who is the destroyer of the second temple. And uh, Turnus Rufus, who um, was in charge of Judea during the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt, rebellion at revolt, and he was responsible for quelling that uprising. So we have a list of um, pretty bad guys who uh, are referred to as Russia. And add to that list, Asaph. There's a big difference between Asaph and all these other people. And that is, he was, yes, he wanted, that's true, but that, that doesn't on its own right excuse him if he was a bad guy, he was a bad guy. He was trying to destroy the tribe, though, wasn't he? No, he was not, at least not in the Torah that I'm familiar with. Everyone, if you're not eating, please just, again, please put on your mask. Okay. Uh, the difference is that there's nothing in the text that indicates that Asaph was such a bad person. Right? Like most of our, yeah. Does it refer, use the word Rasha in the Torah? No. Just in the Midrash? Yeah, in the rabbinic works, correct. Uh, and, and in these other, these other, uh, in these other sources too, it's not in the Torah text. It's in the rabbinic text. But we can understand why the rabbis would refer to someone like Paro as evil because he really was trying to kill everybody. Right? Uh, if we go through Asab's, um, let's say, resume, right? We go through Asab's life, right? It's, we're hard pressed to find why he is uh, considered so evil. So, for example, in his younger years, we're told of his birth. You don't have this on your sheet. Vayetzei Arishon Admoni Kulo Kaderet Seyar Vayikrushimo Esav. The first came out, right? Esav was born. All his body was uh, was hairy. And it's a, there's an etymological connection here. And they called him Esav. Okay, so they called him Esav. But again, nothing inherently wrong uh, with, uh, with what he did. Uh, and then the narrative skips over the childhood of him and his brother, of Yaakov and Esav, and it tells us how they turned out. When the boys grew up, Esav was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a simple man living in tents. Isaac loved Esav, because he was fond of game, or he put game in his father's mouth. But Rivka loved Jacob. So again, here, we see that Esau was an outdoorsman, right? And Jacob was a mild-mannered homebody. Um, but nothing indicating in those psukim, in those verses, that there was anything particularly bad or evil about Esau. He just was different than his brother Yaakov in the sense that, again, Yaakov was a homebody and, and Esau liked to... Uh, like to hunt, he was an outdoorsman. And then we have this famous story that Esav comes home from a hunting expedi expedi expedition, he's hungry, he's exhausted, and he asks uh, Jacob for a portion of his stew, which was red, and that's gonna be an important part of our discussion. He asks him for a portion of his stew, which is red, and then it says, the text then adds parenthetically that uh, this is the basis for his other name. Esav is also called Edom. You should write that down. That's going to be important. E-D-O-M, Edom. We're going to get back to that a little bit later. And so instead of responding directly to his brother's request, Jacob says, well, I'll give you 
some of this stew in exchange for the birthright. And Asaph says, okay, I'm about to die anyway. What use is the birthright to me? Maybe he thought he was going to be killed because he was a hunter and that was dangerous. Or he thought if he didn't get this stew, he was going to die of hunger. Again, nothing particularly nefarious. And then he makes the trade. Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and he drank, and he rose and went away, and Esau spurned the birthright. And then later in life, we have the famous story where Esau is tricked out of the blessing of Isaac. Right? Are you familiar with that story? Isaac is the firstborn. He's supposed to get, uh, Esau is the firstborn. His father wants to bless him. Uh, Rivka says, no way. And she comes up with this whole scheme where Jacob dresses up as Esau and tricks the blind Isaac into giving him the blessing. And then, and then Esau comes back and says, I want the blessing. And his father says, I'm sorry, I gave it to someone else who I thought was you. And Esau lets out a terrible cry. And then he says, at that point, I'm going to kill my brother. That's the only sort of negative piece <laughs> that we have in the text about Esau. Uh, it might be the only piece, but it's pretty large. Well, is it? Is oh, it yeah, he, you, you don't think he deserved it? Yaakov deserved it. Well, no, that's People not. use that kind of expression. I'm going to kill you. That's first of all. Second of all, I could argue that Yaakov deserved it. He 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 took everything from him. His whole uh, his whole entire future was based on that blessing. You can't argue for death for that, can you? I, I, I would I would not be able to. Argue. Well, I could certainly understand why he was angry. And that's and, and by the way, let's say you're right. He says, "I'm going to kill him." Does he? No. Does he have the chance to? Yes, and he doesn't. So even if he was, even if he was unjustifiably anger, and even if he meant it, he didn't do it because when they meet, that was many years later. Right. Exactly. That's exactly the point. But he may have killed him. But he didn't kill him. But he may have killed him if he had seen him back then. But he okay may, could have, should have, would have, but he did not. Right, right. Asaph could have hunted him down if he really wanted to kill him. He would have hunted him down, but he doesn't. He lets him go, and when he not only does he let him go, when he comes back, the Torah records, "Vayaratz Esav lekrato, vayichabkeu, vayipol al tzavaro, vayishakeu, vayivchu." Asaph ran to meet him, embraced him, fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. <laughs> All's well that ends well. But nonetheless, the rabbis really pounce on Esau and um, turn him into a terrible person. The likes of Paro, Haman, people who wanted to destroy all of the Jewish people. So we're going to try to figure out why that is, and we'll start with studying two magicians. Yeah. So even though he lost the birthright, which essentially because Jacob ran away, other than losing his perhaps the uh, the communication and blessing from God, what did he lose? He's the one that hung around and would have been able to inherit everything that Isaac had. Um, well, he, it's it's he, it's the spiritual blessing that he loses out on. Right? He's not the next link in the chain of the right. forefathers. Uh, but you're right, from a, uh, from a perspective of material gain, he does quite well. As we see, he's very rich when he meets back up with Yaakov. So, and that's, in fact, what, Yaakov, what Yitzhak has left for him. After Yitzhak says to him, I don't have a, I, I gave the blessing to someone else. Your brother came with trickery and I gave him the blessing. Asa says, is there anything less, left? And he says, yes, and he gives him a, very, uh, a blessing which is really focused on material wealth. And that's, in fact, what happens. So let's look at a couple of these midrashim where how Esav is depicted, and then we'll try to figure out why. It's also important to know, we're not going to get into it so much, but Rashi is the one who really, really doubles down on how bad Esav is, right? There are lots of biblical commentaries, 
But Rashi is the one who almost, whenever he has the opportunity, quotes a negative midrash about Asaf. Why that is, is another interesting question. But let's, let's jump right in. So we're going to start with the sheet of paper that says Asaf Harasha, the depiction of Asaf in the midrash. Okay, everyone have that one? Make sure we're all looking at the same page. Okay, here we go. Uh, so we start with a pasuk in Genesis. Vayigdulu an arim, vayihi esav ish yodeat sayed, ish sadeh, v'yakov ish tam yoshev ohalim. When the boys grew up, Esav became a skillful hunter, a man of the outdoors, but Jacob was a mild man who stayed in camp. We're on this one now. Yeah. Okay, so the, the, the rabbis have a particular question about this pasuk, about this verse. Could anyone think of what the, what the question the rabbis have on this pasuk? What's that? Oh, no, no. What's the question the rabbis may have on this pasuk? Okay, that is a question they have, but not the question we're going to address. <laughs> That's good. The rabbis are, 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 are wondering what the first two Hebrew words tell us. Baigdalu hani translated, and the boys grew up. And then we know that one was one way and one was the other way. Did this was this not apparent earlier? Right? What's the why do we need to know that the boys grew up? Boys are born and then boys grew up, grow up. So the pastor could have said, Asa was a skillful hunter, a man of outdoors. Jacob was a mild man who stayed in camp. We're not the, the, it seems at first that the words and the boys grew up do not give us any additional information. But they did grow up with. Um, liking one and dead liking the other. That would shape them. Correct. But that's not this, that's not in that that's not in this puzzle, right? This verse is talking about their different characters. Right? And it's, it, it does say that uh, as we saw, that uh, Rivka liked Yaakov and uh, Isaac liked Asaph. That's true. <clears throat> but what does these two words that they grew up? This this does not mean that they were brought up differently by their parents, right? They grew up a natural growth, right? So what's it telling us? So the Midrash picks up on this and answers. And let's learn this Midrash together. Source number two, arim, and the youths grew up, or the boys grew up. Rabbi Levi Amar, mashal lahadas v'itzvonit shehayu gidelim ze al gabeze. There's an analogy here to a myrtle and a wild rose bush which grew next to each other. The kevan shehigdilu v'hifrichu zenotein recho v'zechocho. When they had grown, one gave forth the scent and the other the thorns. Kach, kol yud gimel shana shnehem holchim l'beit ha-sefer u'shnehem ba'im mi-beit ha-sefer. So for the first 13 years, they went to school and they came home after school. La'achar yud gimel shana after they were 13, ze haya holech levate midrashot, this one, presumably Jacob, went to the houses of study, ze haya holech levate avodat kochavim, and the other one went to idolatrous temples. And that is the midrash's answer for Vayigdaluhan Nerim. What's the answer? What are the rabbis telling us here? Yes. Turned away. <laughs> when? When? Right. Right. When? Only when they got older. They got when they were thirteen. Meaning, just like when you plant a myrtle and a and a rose bush, when you first plant them, they're indistinguishable from each other. You don't know which one's going to have thorns and which one's going to smell lovely. But when they grow up, we say, oh, this one's the myrtle. And this one's the thorn bush. So similarly, Esau and Yaakov were the same. We're very similar to each other as kids. 
It was, they were indistinguishable, just like the thorn bush and the myrtle are indistinguishable early on. When they got older and they were able to make their own decisions, right, then the distinctions between the two brothers became apparent as Jacob would go to the house of study and um, Asa would go to the idolatrous temple. So we see here, right, this is an example, right, of the rabbis attaching negative uh, traits to Esav with little textual evidence, right? Little may be an overstatement, right? With little textual evidence. Okay, now, what we have to understand, we have to do a little bit more of a deep dive into, uh, into this verse, okay? How many, how many descriptions of each are given in the verse? Take a careful look at verse, at, at source number one, Genesis 25, 27. Right? And how many character traits are presented for Esav and how many character traits are presented for Yaakov? Two for each. Two for each. Good. So Esav is a skillful hunter, a man of the outdoors. Yodea Tsayid is a skillful hunter. Ish Sadeh is a man of the outdoors. Yaakov is an Ish Tam, a mild person or a straightforward person. Yoshevo Halim, who stayed in the camp. Okay. I think what the rabbi, I think what the rabbis are doing here is they are they are providing a very close reading of the parallel between the two, which is, which is a, a, a typical and important way to read biblical verses, right? So Yodea uh, Tsayid, skillful hunter, is parallel to Jacob's being mild-mannered and Ishtam, straightforward, and Esav's Ish Sadeh, the man of the outdoors, is parallel to Jacob's Yoshevo Halib. Right? It's parallel to Jacob being the, uh, the, the, the person who stayed uh, in the camp. So the way that this works out is Asaph being a man of the field parallels, again, Jacob being in the tent. And a man who knows trapping is parallel to the one who is, uh, who is um, Tom who is straightforward. So the Yodeat Syed, this is the key, Yodeat Syed, Asa being a skillful hunter, is parallel to Jacob being straightforward, which at first glance don't seem to match up. Right? The, 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 the second one matches up, right? That Asa was an outdoors person and Jacob liked to stay inside. That makes sense. But what's the parallel between Yodeat Sayyid, Asa being a hunter, and Jacob being straightforward? Those don't seem to be talking about the same character traits, which the rabbis want that to happen. The rabbis want to read the verse that way, and that is going to be a major part of how they get to what we're going to see next. Yes. Um, this may or may not relate, but, but Jacob, okay, I used to have hunting or whatever. Jacob's in the tent and cooking. Among, among other things, he's cooking, right? He's a chef. We don't know. Well, that's that's what they mentioned. That's what they mentioned. Where? He was, he was cooking stew. Uh, you know, I don't want to Oh, he's cooking a stew. Okay. So, okay, so, so among other things, he cooked. I mean, People who stay home do they cook? Okay. Maybe he cleans up, whatever. Maybe. Good. Okay. But where do you get where do you get the where do you get the meat from the cook? Because he must have got it from Esau. Uh, or <laughs> maybe first of all, it was a lentil yeah, stew. I, I could have called him in. But he he, he, he but did he get his he, in the in the story where he stole the blessing. He gets a, he gets the food from his mother. Yeah. Well, we, at this point, we don't know he's going to steal the blessing. No, I'm saying in context, we know that they had that they that they their food didn't oh, only. So in context of reading the whole thing, we know that their food did not only come from the field, they also had a pen and they can get their food from there. 
Can you have pens in like a warehouse or something? No, like a, a pen. Yeah, uh, a pen to yeah. keep the. Yeah. yeah but we're, okay, so but what I'm saying. So what's the point? What's your there point? Be, there may be an extra link in the supply chain, but it's, uh, uh, my point is it's related because whatever Jacob was using to cook, maybe he was supposed to cook vegetables that used to be out of it. Okay. Okay, do what, do what okay, that's interesting. Okay, good. That's a good point. Okay, well, well said. So we're making good. a distinction between farming and hunting then, because you're saying you had a pen like a farmer. I was no, that, that was a separate point. Okay. But my point was that the food did not necessarily come from ASAV, it could have come from other sources, which we see later on in the in the chapter. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so this notion, we have to keep we have to keep this in mind, right? You you should circle Yodeat Syed, skillful hunter. And Tom, mild. And I, I think I want to translate Tom not as mild, but as straightforward. Ah, so we're gonna so so that's the question. We're trying to figure out what is is there some sort of connection between being the hunter and being straightforward. Okay. Honest. What you see is what you get. Yeah. Well, why is the hunter not what you see? What ah, you so that's what we have to see. That's that it does not seem to work. That's the question the rabbis are dealing with. And that's what we're going to deal with in this next part of the midrash. So let's look back on to the source that the first page that I gave you. I'm going to skip down to where it says, and Asa was a man who knew how to hunt. In the Hebrew, it's right in the middle of the paragraph, right after the parentheses where it says Bereshit Khafe Khafzayan. By he Asav Ish Yodeat Sayed. Okay? Everyone see that? Yeah. Okay. Now the rabbis get right to it. By he Asav Ish Yodeat Sayed. Asav was a man who knew how to hunt. Sad et habriot bifiv. There it is. He trapped people with his mouth. Underline that. Sad et habriot bifiv, and that solves our textual problem. Now we have to figure out what he did, see what he did, but that solves our textual problem. Again, we're paralleling A to A and B to B. A in the A sub column is he was a hunter, he trapped things, and A in the Jacob column was that he was Tom, straightforward, honest, what you see is what you get. Those things have to be parallel somehow. Okay, because that's how the rabbis the, the rabbis are reading the verse. Hold on one second, I'll get to you. So, how could what does that mean? Well, if, if Yaakov was straightforward and honest, then Syed, the trapper, Asav, must mean something other or in addition to being an actual trapper. And he trapped people with his mouth. He tricked people. Dishonest. He was dishonest. And we're going to see how that we're going to see some examples that the rabbis give. What's the source of okay. the link for that? The link is we have column A for for we have column A for A sub and column B for A sub and column A for Jacob and column B for Jacob. Oh, so I'm referring to the trapping with the mouth. That, that, that's what I'm explaining. Column A for A sub, he what he knew how to trap. Column A for Jacob is he was honest or straightforward. Those two things have to be parallel, according to the way the rabbis are reading the verse. So how do you make those things parallel? You have to read one of them in a creative way. So they choose to read the ace of one in the creative way and say, well, if Jacob was honest, and, we're trying, and the verse is trying to show how the boys are different. That's the first piece, right? That's, we, we established that already. The verse is trying to show how the boys grew up and they ended up different. So what's the difference between someone, what's the difference between someone who is honest and straightforward and someone who is not honest and straightforward? The one who's not honest and straightforward tricks people. The one who's honest and straightforward is, is but, but honest we're, and straightforward. We're taught later in Jacob's life that he's particularly dishonest. Ah, we're gonna get there. Excellent. That's a very good point. But at this point, this is what the rabbis have. That's a great question. But they're pulling that out of thin air. Well, not really out of thin air. They're using a typical classic way to read verses. When verses give lists and parallels, you have to try to figure out how they line up. And this is what they are. It's certainly not 
what we call pshat. It's not the straightforward. Uh, yeah, it's not the straightforward meaning of the text. It is a homiletic, we'll call it, exegetical attempt to understand the text. And what m some people will argue is a rabbinic look back at a way to try to paint Asav in a very negative way, which we haven't decided why they would want to do that yet. We'll get there. But first, we're going to see how they do it. And now, once we see how they do it, then we'll try to figure out why they do it and why it may seem like a stretch, which is which is what you're which what's troubling it. Correct. Yes. Or a couple of things. Yeah. First of all, trapping and killing animals for the purpose of eating and consuming is a necessary part of human existence. That's what God intended. There's nothing dishonest about hunting game. Agreed. Okay, I mean, They're not saying he was dishonest hunting his game. They're saying besides being a good hunter, he was also dishonest. Asa, Asa. Asa. What did Asa do that was dishonest? In the text, nothing. But in the rabbi's world, a lot. And, that, and that's, that, that's what comes next. And again, this is all part of the rabbinic attempt of, of I guess we'll call it biblical character assassination. Right? There's nothing, there's very little in the actual text about Asa. But what we do have is two things. He threatened to kill his brother. And his name is Edo. Don't forget that his, uh, his nickname is Edo, and that is going to be key. Okay, Jacob's nickname is Edo, but whatever. Okay. Right. But whatever. Yeah, Although, is it's not, not his nickname, his name. Yeah, his name, yeah. Okay. That's it. Passed. Okay, so now, when is Jacob dishonest? Uh, when, he, in, in, when he asked him to betray his birthright? No. Still? Jacob or? is dishonest when he dresses up as his brother okay. and presents himself. What idea was that? I know Jacob went along with it, but his idea was that. It was his mother's was idea. His but who did it? His mother. Right. So it doesn't make a difference if I say, hey, I really would like you to go kill someone. If you go kill them, no, you can't say, well, that was Rabbi Gelman's idea. Yeah. Right? It was, he did it. And by the way, we're going to see that in Jacob's life, well, well, let's just fast forward. I know later when he tricks later. Right? Jacob tricks Asub, and what happens to him? He gets tricked by, uh, by his father-in-law. So it goes around, comes around, which, is the, which to me is clearly the Torah's way of saying Jacob was wrong. But right. Jacob and Sarah were all Machiavellians. Like they had a, a they felt they had a higher purpose. There's no they. Trickery. They were not working together at all. Sarah, they were working at cross purposes. Sarah, Jacob, Sarah, and Abraham. We're not talking no, no, about Sarah and Yaakov were working together. Sarah. The mother. Yeah. Rivka. No. Rivka. Rivka. Sorry, sorry, Rivka. Sarah, right. Got, got a bit, a bit right. Old. Right. Rivka and Yaakov. Rivka right. Was, so whose idea was it? It was Rivka's idea. Yeah, that's right. Right, right. It's, he's clearly complicit in this. Not only complicit, he, he's the one who does it. He has to walk but in they, the room. But they had, it's a different kind of dishonesty, if you like. I'm not saying one's better or worse, but yeah. it is a different kind of dishonesty because they thought they had a higher purpose for doing it because Rick So this is the end justify the means approach. Yeah, thank you, Belly. And, and okay. so, whereas whatever dishonesty that is, is Esau. Yeah, but the problem is, the dishonesty of Esau is in the imagination of the rabbis. It's one thing if it was in the text. It's a whole nother level of source, right? The dishonesty of, of, of Rebecca and Isaac and, and, and Jacob, it's right there for us to read in black and white. There's no, there's no denying it. There's no avoiding it. This, we'll see. Let's see what happens. Okay, we'll see. This is, rabbi, and again, this is again the rabbinic, this, the rabbis are going for something here. Yeah. The rabbi shooting an arrow at the wall and then painting a bullseye around. So again, I don't want to. I don't. We 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 have to understand why when we were when we read a midrash like this, we have to understand why the rabbis did this, what they were going for, what they were trying to teach us. So let's first learn the midrash, and then we'll try to figure out what why they were doing it. Okay. So he tricked people. How did he trick people? So skip a few pages. Skip a few lines in the English where it says. Um, Abahu, Abahu said in the Hebrew, it is <laughs> nine lines from the top, from the bottom. Ama Rabbi Abahu, and in the English, nine lines from the bottom too. Abahu said, Ama Rabbi Abahu, Shodani Saidani. Sad babayit, sad basadeh. 
robber is the same as hunter. He hunted in the house and in the field. What does this mean? Right? I mean, he hunted in the in the in the house and uh, and in the field. He explains. Where am I here? Hold on. Sorry. Babayit heich mitaknin milcha. He hunted in the house by asking, how does one tithe salt, right? Tithing is referring to uh, certain um, gifts that have to be given uh, to Kohanim, to Leviim, that have to be separated. Now, again, none of this applied during this period of time because the Torah hadn't been given yet. But again, in the rabbinic imagination, we'll, we'll explain. Basadeh heich mitaknin tivna. And how did he trick in the field? He asked similarly, how does one tithe straw? Now, why is that trickery when he asks, how does one tithe salt and how does one tithe straw? Why is that trickery? Sounds like a good question. If you got to tithe these things, Asaph is asking, how do you do it? A little bit of a trick question. You leave gleanings in the well, the answer is these things are not subject to tithes. It's only fruit and, that are, uh, and things that grow in the field are subject to tithe, not straw or salt. So what is Asa doing by asking this question? Well, well he's all, he's with me. He is wasting people's time. But he's trying to trick people, presumably his father, into thinking that he's very pious. I want to tithe things that don't even require it. I'm stringent in my religious observance. And so he tricks, he's, according to the rabbis, he's tricking his father, right, into, uh, into thinking that he, was, uh, that he was a righteous person. Why couldn't he have just been stupid? He uh, could have, but that's the midrash you would write. The midrash the rabbis are writing <laughs> is that he was tricking his... Uh, Again, because again, you have to, the, the, it all goes back to this parallel, Kitsaid the Fiv. His brother was honest. The parallel is that he must have not been honest. So he was tricking people. So if you go back to that parallel, it doesn't leave room for that other point that he was just stupid. It, it, uh, it forces them into this uh, approach that he was tricking his father. Okay? Um, so, again, there's very little textual evidence to this, but the rabbis, the rabbis want to do this. Now, that's, that's sort of one example of the rabbis. Um, and, and by the way, Rashi, as I said earlier, quotes this midrash as the meaning of the pasuk, right? Normally, right, Rashi turns to midrashim when uh, there is no, um, there is no other way to understand the pasuk, but in these cases, Rashi goes right to these midrashim in an attempt to understand the pasukim, which he did not need to because there are other much more straightforward ways to understand these pasukim. Yes. Can you read the midrash to say that Asab was searching? for answers, and Jacob just took everything that he was told. So Asa said, well, how do you do this, and how do you do because that? That's not what the Midrash says. The Midrash says he tricked people. It says it, meaning... Yeah, but his examples... Right, so you can't read the Midrash this way. Right. You can't read only the examples. The examples come in context of the way that the rabbis understand okay, that they, the examples the rabbis are given are not from the torah they've created the examples right what i'm saying is maybe their examples they're giving them as proof for their their stance but maybe their examples can be read a different way and maybe these aren't yeah you could read the examples a different way but the rabbis are the ones who created these examples so it's like reading half a chapter of a book and saying well i'm only going to understand the first the, the second half and completely leave out the context of the first half. Well, yeah, but like in a courtroom, you give you give uh, testimony, 
and you can interpret the testimony in a different way. Is what we're just all I'm saying. Yeah, but I think it's a little different. I understand what you're saying, but in the context, they're, they're, those examples do not exist so without the without the, the rabbis. Rush, the way the rabbis, you don't try to interpret the midrash. No, we no. That's what we're doing. We're interpreting the midrash, but we have to interpret the whole midrash. Because it's their example. We have to interpret the whole midrash, not a, not a, not a piece of it, and the whole midrash in the context of him being a sneak. But you're right. If we look at those examples separately, we could say maybe he just didn't know anything. Or maybe he was just searching for answers. But in the context of the whole midrashic enterprise here, uh, it's hard to do that. But you're right, otherwise we could. Okay, let's look at another midrash. First, yeah, come, uh, yeah look at the um, second sheet. This is another midrash. Okay, the pasuk that the, again, remember we said midrash is always based on a pasuk. So the pasuk the rabbis are struggling with, we're on the page that says 65 1 on the top left. The second sheet that you got looks like this. Okay, not the one we were just studying from, but the other one 65 1 on the set on top left. And there's a verse, chapter 26 34 on the top. Right, Vayihi Esav ben Arbaim Shana, Vayikach Isha et Yehudit, Bat Be'eri Hachiti, Vet Basmat Bat Ilon Hachiti. Esav was 40 years old and he got married. Okay, and it gives us the names of his wives. Anyone, again, the Midrash is always coming to try to understand the difficulty in the Pasuk. What's the difficulty of this Pasuk, you think? Anybody online want to take a stab at it? What's the difficulty in the Pasuk? The word took. Why? Wasn't given. Did he steal? Oh, that's interesting. But that's not what the rabbis are concerned with. Intermarriage. Intermarriage. Well, there was, and everyone was sort of the same back then. It was very old. Ah, so the rabbis are wondering what are we what do we care how old he was when he got married? She wasn't Isha Yudit if she was Batakiti. There were no Jews to get married to. We know that when that that when that when Yitzhak sent uh his uh his servant to find uh, uh, a a uh, a wife for um when Avram sent a servant to find the wife for Yaakov, he wanted him to find them from a certain place and not from another place but it wasn't like there was you know it wasn't like you can go to you know brooklyn and find a nice jewish girl uh to get married to um although it is it is the case that sometimes the wives that the that they took upset their upset them but that's not what's going on here the question going on here is why do we care how old he was she's not you so he was but there was no one you who did then shula who was so you why do you say you did Oh, her name is Yehudit. Her name was Yehudit. Her name was Yehudit. Well, okay. So why do we care how old he was? Because I read on. They say well, he was not. Okay, old. for those who have not read on. Oh. Right? Why why do we care how old he was? I mean, it does, it's a, it does, again, it doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. In the context of the story, we would just say, Asaph hey, got married, and his wife's names were so and so and such and such. Right? It doesn't seem to add anything to the story that he was 40. I think the, I think the point, I guess maybe, the, maybe, I'm not sure, maybe the point you're trying to make is from age 20 to 40, when he was of age, he just went around sticking his women to the skeleton. Ah, but okay. But I don't know, you could do that in those days. You, you are know. devious. I love the way you think. Days, but in those days, you couldn't get away with it. Even today, you can't get away with it. Ah, to a certain point. all right, we'll see. Hold let's Let's read the Midrash. Okay. Yes. Wasn't Isaac also 40 years old? Uh, 30, yeah, could, yes. So you think it's a parallel? Okay, could be. Yeah, yes. The, the Midrash is going to talk about that. That he was, yes, that's going to be an important po point of this. Correct. Okay. Let's read this Midrash. Uh, what's your name? First name? Yes. Oh, Bob. Bob. I think Bob nailed it. What's going on here? 
The Midrash says, Vayi Esa ben Arim Shana, Esa was 40 years old. Adahu Dikhtiv, Icharsmina Chazir Miyar. Thus it is written, a pig of the forest ravages the vine. This is going to get really interesting. Rabbi Pinchas B'Shem Rabbi Simon Omer, Rabbi Pinchas in the name of Rabbi Simon said, of all the prophets, none publicized the deceptive nature of the Romans. Now we're getting a little bit closer to why the rabbis depicted A7 in such negative terms, except two, Moses and Asaf. For Moses said, but this shall you not eat, and the pig, for it has a split hoof, but not the cud, doesn't chew its cud. Asaf said, Asaf, one of the authors of Psalms, the pig of the forest ravages it. The Midras explains, and why does scripture compare the Roman nation to a pig? Because just as when the pig lies down, it spreads forth its hooves as if to say, I am kosher, so too the wicked Roman government steals and robs, and yet it appears as though it spreads a sheet over the table, which means the Roman government steals and robs, yet it has its own legal system, so it makes it, it makes, uh, it, it, to outward appearances, they have a legal system and they have rules, but really it's a, it's, it's a, it's a dishonest, corrupt government. And the pig is the same way. The, right, what's the signs of a kosher animal? The outward sign of a kosher animal is split hooves. The internal sign of a kosher animal is it chews its gut. So a pig, if you look at it, looks kosher because it has split hooves. If you look at the Roman government, it also looks kosher because it has a court system. But internally, if you look at the pig, it's not kosher. And internally, if you would look at the Roman government, if you get into the kishkas, literally, of the Roman government, you would know that it's not kosher. What does that have to do with Esav? Now we get to Esav. Similarly with Esav. Now, it says here, progenitor of the Roman nation. Put that in parentheses for a minute. Similarly with Esav. Throughout his first 40 years, now we know why the 40 years is important, Esav would ensnare married women and violate them. But when he reached the age of 40, he made himself similar to his father Isaac, as Miriam said. He said, just as father married a woman as a 40-year-old, I too am marrying a woman as a 40-year-old. That's why it says, Vayhi Esav ben Abraham Shana. And Esav was 40 years when he got married. What's the point? What, what's the point the rabbis are trying to say? What, what's, I'm sorry, let me back up. What's Esav trying to say when he says, just like my father got married at 40, I'm getting married at 40. I'm just like my father. My father was a righteous person. I'm a righteous person. Forget about the past 20 years or some 20 some odd years that I've been ravaging married women. How do we know he was ravaging married women? We don't. We don't. Right? This is the this is the the this is the uh, the rabbis again painting Asav in this horrible in this horrible way because that's worse. If you're gonna ravage women. And you're going to make someone look bad for it, they might as well be married. He would have never got away with ravaging women, especially a serial ravager in those days. They, they would have killed her. Someone would have killed her. Yeah, it could be. Could be. What happens to, with Adina? Come on. In those days. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Days, no way. So, but again, what's the point? He's a fraud. Just like he was a fraud in the first Midrash. How do you tie salt? How do you tie straw? Right? Trying to come off as being so strict. He's a fraud in this Midrash. By saying, look how righteous I am, just like my father. Right? So the rabbis are not only painting him in a negative context, they're also consistently painting him as a fraud, as a cheat, as a trickster. Okay? So just let's pause there for a second. When I read these midrashim, it occurred to me that um, it occurred to me that this makes perfect sense in the context of what we do know from the text of the Torah. In the text of the Torah, Yaakov is the one who goes and tricks his father out of the blessing, right? Everyone's with me? Okay, so for 20 okay. Years, maybe Yaakov was and so, so I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe this is maybe this is Yaakov thinking the only way I could possibly get this is by stealing it, because my brother has managed to pull the wool over my father's eyes, right? By, uh, by asking him these complicated halakhic questions, 
which everyone who knows Asaph knows you can care not, you can care less about, right? By you know, the question of the order of these things is uh, maybe not consistent, but now he's trying to pass himself off as a righteous person and getting married, right? So the, in Yaakov's mind, he's again justifying himself by going in going along with his mother's scheme because that's how the whole household operated, right? The whole household was just one big, I hate to say it, it was one big scheme after the other. And the parents, at least uh, Isaac, just had no idea. And maybe Yaakov said, you know, trying to explain it to my father is not going to work because he loves Esau because he gives Esau delicious food. Uh, and so I'm not going to win by a rational argument. So I have to, I have to, do, I have to be Esau. Right now it makes sense. Not only is he pretending to have the skin of Esau, Right? He's becoming Asaph because Asaph is this guy. And the only way to get anything from my father is to be this guy. So I'm going to trick him too. And then what happens later after he gets married? He gets tricked by his father-in-law. When his father-in-law pulls the old wife-sister switcheroo. Right? Right? What goes around comes around. Again, as I said, I think that's the Torah commenting on itself. The Torah is saying, yeah, what? Yeah, you don't, don't, you know, uh, look who's calling the kettle black type of thing. Okay, I'll take a couple of comments and then I want to go back and understand why it is that the rabbis painted Asav in this negative way. Yeah. Well, that's the fact that I was trying to suggest that perhaps they wanted to justify um, they wanted to justify Asav being deceitful or, or less by making Esau seem like such a horrible person. Great. I think that's a very plausible answer, right? That, uh, Yaakov looks less bad if we, if we contextualize it and say, well, again, he was just playing by the rule. This is house rules. House rules in that household were the only way you can get anything from your father is if you trick him into believing that you're, that you're deserving. And maybe that's why. Yeah, that could be. Yes. Well, and going on with the next topic, it, it seems that the rabbis are trying to make the case for Jacob to be this wonderful, great guy when they know he's flawed. So they're going to throw as much dirt on Asa as they can. Yeah. And yet, there's nothing in there that says we. You know, there. It says that Jacob did this terrible thing to get the birthright, but there's nothing that says well. You have hearsay that he slept around with married women, but there's nothing that really says, oh, this is exactly what he did wrong. Right. And that's why the rabbis have that parallel in the columns. So the, there must be something. Once the rabbis have come up with the opposite of, of Jacob, of Jacob's straightforwardness is Esau's trickery, then it's then they go to town on what the trickery is based on other verses, right? Again, so, so this, this is important because the other verses, for example, the verse that we saw in the second Midrash um, about Rome and the pig, right? Is gonna become very important uh, as, I, as I'll show you. What's that? It seems the rabbis favor Jacob before they even hear the story. Well, they definitely favor Jacob because Jacob is the is the link in the chain. So for sure, yeah, yeah. Do we know how old Jacob and Esau were at the time uh, Jacob stole the birthright and the getting the blessing from Isaac? Um, well, the in the introduction to that story is the verse that we saw by Yigdalu Hanearim. So they were thirteen plus. No, no, I don't mean when Jacob made the stew, but when he went to Isaac dressed as that's a, that's a, so that oh that's a little bit, that's a little bit after that. It would have had to be. It's after that. I don't think so, we you know, know for sure. Under forty, over forty, it's blue. No, I think it's before because these this verse. No, it's it's either by Bible or chronology. You have to see it before. This no. verse of Asav taking a wife is in twenty six thirty four. 
and the story of the stealing the blessing is earlier. What's the answer? Takes their wives, their cups. Uh, and you know, the rabbis also tell us that yeah, not I'm not sure. A linear chronology in the Torah. So we could, we could, we could look at. You looking up the verses? Okay, great. Yes. The pig thing bothers me. The what thing? The pig. Okay. Is this the pig sitting there saying, "I'm going to be, you know, I'll, I'll pretend I'm kosher so that you'll eat me"? Is this it? Like, is this the pig has this? No, it's just an illustration. Yeah, but that when you look at a pig, you think it's kosher. The pig presents itself externally as kosher. But that to me is a bigger. That, that's how I. That's how I'm seeing this whole thing. Yeah. As hard to believe. Hard to. Explain. What's hard to believe? What they're saying. The way they extract what they want to for Easter. It's hard. It's as hard to believe as the pig sitting there thinking it's kosher. It's just. It just no, the pig is not sitting there thinking no, it's no, kosher. It's a big leap. It just. There's leaks here. All they're all leaks. Well, the, no, the, 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 what the rabbis are saying is if you look at a pig externally, it looks I kosher. That part. Right, so that's saying the pig says hi. I'm, we're not talking no, about like. But what I'm trying to say is to me, yeah. the pig is saying, see, what they're ex extrapolating is as ridiculous as saying the pig is sitting there saying. What are they extrapolating? That, that Esau was sleeping with married women, that he was, you know, doing all this bad stuff. Right. There, there, there is, there is little, there is little, there, there is, there is little textual evidence of that, and that's, that's our, that's what we've been grappling with, right? Is what, what leads the rabbis to paint Asav in such a, a negative, in such a negative way? Do you have it, Maria? Yeah. So the verse about the they're getting married is right before the chapter with where the whole thing of the blessing starts. Okay, so it's before. So it, it so we have the order is they grow up. There's the exchange of the porridge for the blessing. Uh -huh. Then Asaph gets married. Then the stealing of the birthright. Yes. Okay. You were right. Okay. Does that matter to you? I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let me let me share. Go ahead. Well, you know, it took Rebecca a long time. I don't remember years ago. It's still a long time. To finally try to intervene and help Jacob a little bit. But I think maybe Jacob and Esau, there was a conflict between Rebecca and Esau. You don't know it when they get married, but it's acted out. I yes. Think, you know, because one loves one, one loves the other. Yes. And therefore, they're both two, 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 two the sons. They're, they're, they're having their conflict. Right. The the the, the Torah commentator the Nitziv, Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin. The Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin is the Torah who, who amongst other things wrote a commentary commentary on the Torah, makes notes that exact thing that that um, um, Yitzchak and Rivka never really communicated well the about their children. And if you remember, when what was what, what happened when they first met, when Yitzchak and Rivka first met. Do you remember what happened? What Rivka's reaction was? She falls off the camel, and because she just she she's like in awe of him, um, and she puts on a veil, which could sim symbolize some like some some uh, some sort of distance between them, and then Siv uses that. Rabbi Natali of Berlin uses that whole episode and and this to show that they never really. Had a shared uh, path, an understanding of their kids, which may have led to this. And so the, the, it's it's a lesson in in poor marital communication, he says. So you're right. All right. So wh why is this the case? So first of all, Asa is. I'm reading from an article called "The Denigration of Asa," which is from a, a, a website called thetorah.com. If you want to look it up, T O R A H. Dot com. The Torah.com. So Asaph is identified in the Torah with Edom. Now we know that because after he ate the porridge, he said, therefore, his, which was red, and that's what the word Edom means. He says, therefore, Asaph's name is called Edom. So we, the Torah already gives us a connection between Asaph and Edom. Asaph is identified in the Torah with Edom, a nation bordering on Judah to the southeast. 
during the first temple period, Edom was sometimes a vassal of Israel or Yehuda or Judah, and sometimes independent, but was always the weaker party. After the destruction of Judah by the Babylonians in 586 BCE, the Edomites took the opportunity to move into the Negev and southern Judean hill country as far north as Hebron and remained entrenched there even through the time that the Judeans began to return from Babylon to resettle the land. In keeping with this change of fortunes, we begin to see very negative evaluations of Edom during the second temple period. So for example, a verse in Psalms, remember God against the Edomites, the days of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundation. And then the prophet Ovadia, as it follows, the house of Jacob shall be fire, the house of Joseph a flame, the house of Edom stubble, they shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor of the house of Asav, for God has spoken. So once, once the Torah compares or, or aligns Asav with Edom, and Edom is this nation that was a thorn in the side of the Jews, that gets reflected back on Asav, who's the father of this nation, because that's his name. And all of those terrible things that the nation of Edom did are then retroactively attached to Asav. So if this nation did all these terrible things to the Jewish people, the father of this nation must have been a terrible person. Hence, ravaging married women tricking his father, right? Any, any, and anything good about him is fake and all the bad stuff, uh, all the bad stuff is real. And then later on, we get a, a connection between Edom and Rome. And Rome are the really bad guys in Jewish history. In the Roman period, Edom and Asa come to represent Rome. While many factors led to this identification, one major factor, this is interesting, was the position of Herod, who was appointed by Rome as the king of Judea, and who was from a family of Edomite converts to, Ju to Judaism. So you have this guy, Herod, who's a, rep who's, a re who's a representative of the Romans, who was from Edom, who is Asav. And now, now, you have this, now you have this connection between Asav and Rome, and Rome, we know, <laughs> are the arch enemy of the, uh, of the, uh, of the Jewish people. He and his descendants were hated by many Judeans, and their acting as Roman proxies helped solidify the Edom equals Rome equation. The rabbis were heirs of the disdain for Herod, and the Midrash and Talmud take the equation of Edom and Rome for granted. Living in the time after the destruction of the temple and the quashing of the Bar Kokhba uprising, Rome in the guise of Edom was despised. And so now, once Rome is Edom, is Esav, it's open season to pile everything on the progenitor of that. And that could be, according to this article, why, uh, why Esav gets this bad rap. There's really not that much about it in the text itself, but all these other things about him are the result of him being the root of Edom which leads to, which is, which is the same as Rome. And we all know Rome is terrible, legitimately terrible, right? And so therefore, Esau uh, is uh, blamed, if you will, for all of those things. Yes, yeah, so I, I told you, we have to get to the end. We have to get to the punchline for, in order to make sense. It makes sense, it's still a little unfair. What about the red shoe? The what? That's Edo. That's the word. That's why Asub becomes called Edo because he eats the red stew. Okay, everyone. Have a wonderful day. I hope to one more week. Yes, next one week. week. One more week. See you next week. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Thank you for joining. Thank you.